make sure my phone's actually on silent. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So before I begin, uh, I would like to say thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity. I, I will say that while I am a Floridian, with a, a my family has a pretty long history in the state. Uh, we're from the southwest side, and so this is actually my first um, time here, and it's such a beautiful town, and, uh, and so I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. So that being said, um, this book is an attempt to get people thinking about er America's earliest history, America's earliest stories, right? When, when it, it begins um, with the first Thanksgiving, it ends with 1619. These were two really important uh, anniversaries that sort of like had me thinking about America's, you know, mythology, America's story, and why it doesn't include Florida, and why even though a lot of firsts were actually here, why people sort of just so easily breeze past that to talk about another place and another time that actually, you know, took place later. And so that was sort of the, the reason why this happened. <laughs> And um, I structure it in, in a unique way. It's not specifically... Let me see if this works. All right, we got it. It's not specifically chronological. It's topical and chronological. And it covers all of these different ways that, that Florida... Um, and, and by the way, La Florida is not just the peninsula of Florida. It is the entire southeast, right? It is everything from Virginia down to Florida, west of the Mississippi, Texas. It is, La Florida is Spain's claim and Spain's attempt to colonize North America. So it's got, it's, it's much more than just the state history. And, and it, it, I connect it to Spanish colonialism elsewhere, um, which we'll go over in a little bit. There are connections between the Caribbean, North and, uh, and, and Central and South America. Then I talk about origin stories, and we'll talk about a little bit of that. And a lot of that is uh, the, the Catholic drive to colonize, to missionize. It's an example of an origin story. And then we'll talk about transformations, how you know, the Spanish were key to sort of transforming. And again, you know, I use this opportunity to say this is not a triumphant, triumphalistic interpretation of Spanish colonialism. It was really terrible and problematic and it had really devastating consequences for the native peoples of the southeast in, in several different ways. But it is also a story of transformation and we don't get to this here but right, the Seminole tribe of Florida is an example of the transformation that takes place here. Um, so we have transformations and then we have legacies. Some of the legacies of Spanish colonialism that you still see in the 21st century that, um, that have Spanish roots. And I just, I, I gave a talk at, um, in Orlando the other day, and it was a different talk than this. And what it really focused on was cattle and oranges, which make their way south from St. Augustine into north central Florida. And, and when William Bartram travels through the St. John's River in the 1760s and 1770s, I mean, it's like he can't throw a rock without hitting orange trees. They're everywhere. And the, Span the cattle that become American cattle are actually Spanish cattle. And we'll talk a little bit about barbecue, and, you know, a little bit about barbecue, but, you know, that's another example, because Spaniards bring the pigs, but who is smoking the meat? Natives, right? And so that's actually a little bit of a confluence of two different cultures there. So it's all about sort of um, talking about different ways of looking at connections between the past and the present. And so I always like to do my best, it's never perfect, but to do my best to teach, to talk, to, um, to engage with where I am physically. And where we are is more or less the center of this place, which is a fantastic opportunity to do this. So can all of these things exist in one place? And, you know, I would absolutely say yes, right? I, I use John Wirth's images in a lot of ways. He, uh, in a lot of times, he, he teaches at the University of West Florida. And, 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 and what you'll notice is there are Spanish attempts to colonize everywhere in Florida, but don't you notice, I mean, it's very distinct on the southern Atlantic coast. And there's a reason for that. And so you can see in Spanish attempts to colonize everything from, say, where I teach in Myrtle Beach, all the way down to um, St. Augustine. This is a really intense place of attempted colonization and colonization. And so where we are right now is really like the epicenter in a lot of ways of this book and of all of these connections. So I first give you 
uh, back out a little bit. And, and, and there's actually a much larger story that goes even further back. This is the age of exploration, 15th to 17th century when world markets open up. No one wants to get here. Everyone wants to get over here where the trade is. And we think of um, the Silk Road. It could be the Opium Road. It could be the Cinnamon Tea Orange Sugar Road. It could, be, it could be anything. Everyone wants to get here. That makes certain European powers very, very influential. Like, that's called the Italian Renaissance for a reason. They are the gateway to the Silk Road. They control it. That's why Genoans and Venetians rise to be these city-state powers of brokering and business and banking and trade. And who are the absolute losers at the end of the road? So they basically have to invent a new way to get to what we now know as um, the nations of um, you know, Malaysia, China, India, the, the Far East, as they would say, to where these markets are. And they invent the boats. They invent the technology. They invent caracks and caravels and galleons and, and Portuguese nows. And, when, and they invent celestial navigation, right? I mean, you can't invent the stars, but you invent the way of interpreting them so that you can go further and further away from the coast and come back alive. And what they do is they basically discover a current system. And what that current system will do is it will bring you to North America. And we all understand this current system. This is a very, this is the same current system. <laughs> From the Cape Verde Islands, you hang the left through the Guinea Channel and the current, and Vasco de Gama and Bartolomeu Diaz, Diaz do that, and that's the Spanish Empire. You hang the right, it doesn't matter if anyone is alive or dead on that boat, it will run aground in the Bahamas. It has to, right? And so, again, we know this, and, and, and when I was speaking earlier, um, a couple days ago, another storm had just passed through. It is, it's a very sort of real thing that you have to deal with. So we know that, that whoever discovers this will be the one to get to the Caribbean, and therefore South America, Central America, and North America. So you push off from Lisbon or Cadiz, and, and all of a sudden, all of these islands come into view, like the Madeiras, the Canaries, the Cape Verdes. And when you're at the Cape Verdes, then the current comes into view. And that becomes something very quickly that is known and manipulated. It's not the only, I mean, this is very imprecise, right? There are also trade winds that are very important here. But when you take this into consideration, here's one of our first connections. On the north side of what is now the Dominican Republic is Puerto Plata. And there is a castillo in Puerto Plata that looks like it came right out of the medieval period. Circular turrets. That is clearly pre-gunfire, if that makes sense. That wouldn't stand a chance, right? But that is mid-15th, uh, no, mid-16th century. And what we have there is one of our first real stories of the American Southeast, which sounds insane when I say it like that, but here is the connection. From Puerto Plata, you have Lucas Vazquez de Ayon. In 1528, following the knowledge of people that have sort of come before him, they are moving their way through the Bahamas, which are known as the Lucayas. And this is a story of why how Spanish colonialism is not a triumphant thing, because they are going from island to island, stealing every single human being that is there until there's no one left. But the point is, you have run out of islands. And if you look at this current system, which I have gone the wrong way, and I apologize, the Antilles runs right across the Bahamas. And if you run right across the Bahamas, searching for the next island, what is the next island? It is right here. It is South Carolina. It is Georgia. <clears throat> From there, right to there. And so you have Lucas Vazquez de Ayon, a Spaniard from Santo Domingo, landing in Winyah Bay and then landing again in Brunswick, somewhere in southern Georgia. And that's where he attempts his first settlement. And my Spanish is decent, but it's not that good, because this is really old Spanish, and, and X's become J's and B's become V's. But what it basically says is, here, right, the lawyer Ion left Santa Domingo at Puerto Plata, where he embarked his men too, too few to maintain the place or to maintain the force of the land, 
and they left. Seritara um, X is a you know a B or a J. They left with in fear. Bierno is winter because winter because v, Venito is to come because the winter came and it was too bad and too cold and they all died. And that's essentially what that said. And whoever has to leave, leaves. And that is a story of a failed attempt to colonize, which is why 1528 is not the first settlement, right? But it is an example of how there are lots of examples in this book. A lot of people failed before um, Pedro Menendez de Avilas got it right. But now fast forward about only 20 or 30 years, because this is still after the fall of Tenochtitlan. This is after, this is right around the time when the Aztec Empire and then the Incan Empire fall to Spanish conquistadors. And what happens is you're forcing natives to mine silver, you're forcing natives to mine gold. How do you get that back to Spain? You use the currents. These currents are pretty straightforward. These are the treasure fleets. I mean, there really is a time where there are boats loaded with gold and silver. And this is a very treacherous route because it takes, at, it takes months once you get there. It takes months once you to get there. And then it takes months to get there. But Cartagena is the, the silver of the world. Veracruz, San Juan de Lua is a massive fortification. It's like a bank vault. These are huge bank vaults that hold all of the combined exploited wealth of the new world. And to come in, you take the Caribbean current. And stop, stop, stop. Then the Caribbean current transitions to the Yucatan current. You shoot the Yucatan gap, take a left to Veracruz via the Mexican current. Then you take the loop current through the Gulf. You all land at Havana, which is why if you look at a satellite picture of Havana, the harbor has got about eight different forts that protect it because it's a very strategically important fort. And then everyone hops on the Florida current to the Gulf Stream back out to the Canaries. And that's the way that everything gets done. And what we know is, this is a very simplified map that would say, hey, just shoot right out there. Well, you don't do that because you would run into the Bahamas and everyone would die. What you have to do is hug the stream, hug the current until it shoves you out, and it does not shove you out there. It shoves you out closer to the outer banks. And so what that does is, you can sit on the beach here, and you could probably wave to these ships. They come by so closely because the current is so close. I grew up here, and um, you know, you go deep sea fishing, and this is like a joke. You don't go deep sea fishing, right? Because you have to go out like 200 miles to get to deep water. Here, right, you, you go out from Isla Morada, and it's like 20 feet, and then you go up to the reef, which is like 6 feet, and then it's like you just watch your depth finder, and it's like 10 feet, 100 feet, 1,000 feet, and you're like, oh my God, right? If you ever want to realize how small you are in the world, you just watch that depth finder. That's why, I mean, it's like a channel that channels water, and it brings you right by this area. That's why this area is so strategically important. It is the back door of the entire colonial world. It does not matter where you enter or what you do. You must sail past that. And if anyone sees it, that is your original I-95. <laughs> From Miami all the way up to the Carolinas, right? It is the pipeline of the South. And early attempts, more unsuccessful ones, before Pedro Menendez de Avilas goes to St. Augustine, Tristan de Luna and Ariano lands here in what would become Pensacola in 1559, and he doesn't last past 1560. His orders are to do two things, settle there and settle there. Because if you settle there and settle there and build a road between the two, no one will ever have to go through that accursed piece of water ever again. That is the most dangerous stretch of water in the world in the 17th century. And we know that now. I mean, does everybody remember three days ago? If, if you were on a boat when that front hit, you were dead. If you are in the summertime and your barometer starts dropping rapidly, you have no chance because a hurricane is coming. <coughs> Right? And, and there are no places to stop here. And worse yet, piracy. If everyone's funneled in the same 90-mile channel, I mean, doesn't that make sense? That's where everyone's going to hang out. And so this is a really dangerous place. So uh, Tristan de Luna lands in September to try to establish Pensacola. And does anybody want to take a wild guess of what happens to him? He is immediately hit with a massive hurricane. 
And we know this is where I use, this is John Worth stuff again. I mean, he's done some of the archaeological work. We found several of his ships because they were sunk in, in mud in basically the harbor. And uh, it's, you know, really terrible. The, the, there's another transformative moment that I talk about in the book where he basically says, I have plan B, and plan B is to go up into these Mississippian societies that grow a bunch of corn. It will sustain you. He didn't give up immediately. He marched in there, and there's nobody there that should have been there because DeSoto had moved through there and had already spread disease, and, and the transformation was already underway. He's basically opened up this book that says DeSoto was full of crap, right? Everything that he said was there is not there. Well, it was there until everybody died, right? So that's a, a, a side of the story that we don't, we don't go into here. But what happens in the meantime? French, right here. Closer to here than, than St. Augustine, obviously, right? <laughs> Charles Fort in uh, what is now sort of Paris Island, I would love to go there. And I think, I'm pretty sure legally you can, but it just happens to, you have to drive through Paris Island to get there. And so you have to have, I mean, I'm pretty sure that it is public. You have to go through some security checkpoints to get there. But that's where it is. It's, it's really, like right at the tip of the Marine Corps recruiting station at Paris Island, right? Santa Elena, very close to Beaufort and Port Royal. This was the original... Um, French settlement, and then they attempt another French settlement down here at, at uh, the St. John's River. Fort Caroline. Fort Caroline. Right, and by the way, you know, remember the name St. John's. Remember the name, the, you know, uh, these are all saint names for a reason because they're Catholics that are discovering them, right? And they name everything after another connection that we don't really develop. But uh, if it's not something that is, has incredible physical value, like the Keys are the martyrs because everyone dies in the Keys. The Tortugas are the Tortugas because they land there and find a bunch of turtles. Um, if they don't find something really incredible, they name it after a saint. <laughs> no, I mean, this is, I'm not, I'm not, no, they do because, because there's a Spanish, there's a, there's a Catholic calendar of saints and feasts. And, uh, and you name it after the day. Um, and the day aligns with the calendar of saints and feasts, right? Everyone knows this. Pascua Florida, that's a feast day. Uh, let's see, there's like 15 Espiritus Santos. Um, these are all feasts. And uh, these are all feasts and they are saints. And the, and the answer to why there's always, there's more than one, you would think, why is there like seven different Espiritus Santos? Because you only use the saints about a four-month stretch. Because you're not there in... October, because that's hurricane season. You're not there in December and January, because that's cold front season. Your safe sailing is, uh, is March to June and July, right? And that's when all these saints, you know, uh, Pascua Farida is March 31st, April. That's right in the middle of the time where you are least likely to die, right? <laughs> Espiritu Santo is early June. That's relatively safe sailing. So Fort Caroline exists. And we all know the story of us being here. In fact, you know, uh, it's fantastic. I was, just, I was just hearing from the introduction that this is not the first time or the last time that you will hear the history of this region, right? The early French history. Um, this, is, this is established stuff. This is, by the way, this is one of those moments where you don't name a river after a saint. You name it after a massacre, La Matanza, <laughs> which is where Pedro Menendez the Aviles hunts them down and kills every single one of them on the beach. It's actually like three separate massacres. I talk about that. That's actually the introduction of the book. That's actually the first Thanksgiving, which is really messed up. Right? He, is giving, <laughs> he is giving thanks. Pedro Menendez de Avilas is giving thanks. He is dining with the Indians and giving thanks on four separate days. He gets there alive. He found St. Augustine alive. He kills Jean Rebol, and he kills the rest of them. That's, those are your four. It's pretty incredible. But he also says... I hung out with the local Tamuqua, and we had a feast of Thanksgiving. And you're like, I mean, there it is. It's objective historical fact, right? That is why St. Augustine exists. St. <clears throat> Augustine is there for religious reasons. It's there because it establishes your claim to territory. It's all on paper if you're not actually there. This is why St. Augustine exists when everyone who goes there hates it. It never makes money for the crown. It is the only colony that only exists off subsidies. It, they only build that fortress after it gets raided for like the 10th time. Robert Cyril, Cyril um, in, uh, in the 1680s 
basically burns like the fifth wooden fort to be burned. And, and the, the colonial government in, in Madrid and then the Viceroy of New Spain basically says, we either have to abandon this place or we have to take it seriously. And that's when you begin building the stone fortress. It is there to protect the treasure fleets. They go down in storms. They go down because of pirates. And if you look at the earliest attempts made by Pedro Menendez de Avilés, St. Augustine is only one of many. He establishes Santa Elena. He establishes St. Augustine. He establishes one in Ais, Tequesta, Calusa, and Tocobaga territory. What is he doing there? He is protecting every possible place that you could go shipwreck. Actually, you know, when I was writing this book, when I was finishing it up, I would go hang out with my family. They lived very close to Boca Grande, and you could just, like, hang out on the beach and be like, God, this is so beautiful. Could you? Like, people did not see it that way 400 years ago. I mean, it is really a meditation on how the idea of natural beauty has changed over time. I mean, if you were sitting on that beach in 1560, you were going to die there because no one was going to come save you, right? And you were only there because you're shipwrecked. Another attempt made from this neighborhood, from Santa Elena, Juan Pardo gets all the way up to basically the Smokies and turns around. Do you know what he was ordered to do by Pedro Menendez de Avilés? Build a road to northern Mexico. <laughs> that was the road that would connect Pensacola, Right? But he says, go to Mexico. No one has any idea how big the continent of what is now the United States is. So he says, all right, just go to... So you can imagine right there, you know, what's he hitting right there on the Tennessee River? A bunch of really high mountains. And everyone's looking around going, I don't know where we are, but I'm pretty sure we are not in Mexico. We need, we, need to, we need to turn around. And he actually turns around and comes back. Well, you know, that is this. How close is he to Mexico? Not close at all, right? But that's an excellent example of how little anyone actually knows about this place. We have these maps of the continent where it's just the outline, and there is literally nothing in the middle. And that's because they were, that's not because they were trying to save ink. They didn't know what was there. They'd never been there. And again, to continue the story, there was Santa Elena up the coast from here. We would have, right here, we were bracketed. St. Augustine to the south, Santa Elena to the north, Santa Elena existed. And again, there's a golf course there now <laughs> at the tip of Paris Island, but there are also several monuments to Charles Fort and Santa Elena. Santa Elena was actually a half-decent settlement, hundreds of settlers, <laughs> in 1586, 1584, when Sir Francis Drake comes calling. This is during the Great Sea War, when, when Queen Elizabeth is basically unleashing what she calls the sea dogs to basically go to war with Spain in any way you can. They aren't pirates because they hold letters of mark and reprisal, which is actually written into the U.S. Constitution. Right? The president can actually issue letters of mark and reprisal, and they've done it several times. He holds letters. He's actually knighted because of this. So he burns his way through the Canaries, then he burns his way through Santa Domingo, then Cartagena, and guess where he stops? He burns St. Augustine to the ground. It's one of the first maps we actually have, you know, an English map of St. Augustine. Here are his men landing. He floats right by Santa Elena. And St. Augustine is seen as being so important that instead of abandoning St. Augustine, they abandon Santa Elena. Now, that is not the end of this because St. Augustine becomes the center of colonial activity. And what we have here is another connection and another transformation, and that is the mission system here of which we are at the center of an entire Spanish mission province. There are four of them. There's Tumuco, Apalachi, Mocama, and Wali, or Wall. And we are in the Mocama, right on the frontier between Mocama and Wall, right here. And so you have, by the way, um, in, the, in the tradition of naming saints, right, you go Saint Native. So you go, the mission is Saint um, San Juan de Puerto is, is a bad example. That's not a native. But the Mocama, Wale, Tolomato, um, these are the missions, and, and uh, Santa Catalina is the largest. It's, it's a little bit further up to the north, but we actually have a decent archaeological record of that because it was around for 100 years, and it was a convento, and it was they had an enclosed nave. This is, this is one of the things that... Um, Florida, it's really hard to find most of these missions because they were built using palmetto and pine. 
You go out to Texas and California, they're built with rock and adobo, right? They're always going to be around. Those disappear relatively quickly. But Santa Catalina does not. And so you have this incredible mission presence here. Another incredible um, place that connects all these dots. These are, these are horrible places for natives. They are told right, that, that, that you, need to, you need to speak Spanish. You need to be a good Catholic. By the way, you also need to canoe all of your grain down through the rivers, down to St. Augustine. There is a repartimiento, a forced labor draft. There are haciendas to grow wheat and, and cows. These missions and the reducciones, right, the, 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 the mission towns, they are vectors for disease. This is the slow and steady depopulation of a native people through basically being A, overworked, and B, diseased. It is the missions. You think of like Hernando de Soto as being the agent of destruction of the Southeast, and he really does do some really, truly horrible things in the Southeast. But even with guys on horses, with metal weapons, you just can't physically kill that many people before you just can't even lift the sword anymore, right? In Mavula in Alabama, he kills like five or 6,000 people. He burns the whole town down. That's the largest cause of death. You're talking tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. And what we have is more or less the destruction of this place. They are overworked. There are several rebellions. There was a Wale rebellion in 1597. There's a Temuco rebellion in 1656. There's an Appalachian rebellion. This pressure on natives to basically give up their lifestyle, and we'll end today with some, with some primary sources to show all that. But the death blow begins right here. And that's because Charleston comes into existence. Charleston is the Anglican Church. St. Augustine is Catholicism. It, like, it is very hard to express, and, and it is very hard to try to describe how violent this, this difference in religious values. I mean, the, the, the Matanzas massacre right here is because the French were Calvinists and Lutherans. And Pedro Benedes of Avilas basically says it. He says, I am here to hang and kill every one of you, and I will do it. And he does actually do it. Well, none of that really has gone away by 1670. It's mellowed out a little bit. You're not going to march there just to destroy heretics. But these are colonial rivals. And the English in Charleston, they will take advantage of any war that they can get. Queen Anne's War. And they will unleash everyone, and they will come down, and they will destroy every single mission in Florida. In 1704, 1705, they will invade Appalachia, and there are incredible, unbelievable massacres in Appalachia and Temuqua. Before that, the 1680s are the first time that natives will show up in Wally territory. And they are Westos. They are a group that the, that the, that the Charlestonians, the English, will go to them and say... <coughs> Here is this brand new tool that you have no idea what it is. It's a firearm. And there are two things that you can do to buy this firearm. This firearm costs about 200 deer skins, or one young male will get you two firearms. And you use one native group to attack and destroy another. And what happens in 1686 is the first boat of the Wesso show up at Santa Catalina. And they systematically, basically destroy every mission. Santa Catalina will be displaced from St. Catherine's Island down to Amelia Island. It will be here. <laughs> Santa Catalina de Wale is a 100-year-old mission. And the year of its destruction, I believe, is either, it goes from 1705 to, I mean, it goes from 1605 to 1705. It is displaced, displaced. It is one of the largest, most fortified, and even it can't stand it. The only place that remains is St. Augustine. So that maybe there are 20,000 Wale on the southeastern coast at the time of contact. By the time of the slave raids, there's 2,000, which means you're already facing a 90% epidemic depopulation. And by the time the Spanish leave St. Augustine in 1763, there are less than 100 that literally get on boats and they sail away to Havana. There are, they are among the several languages, and this is not so true with the Wale because we have so many 
documents from the Spanish friars that we have actually been able to reconstruct some of these languages. The best example is the Tuzmuqua. We have so many confessionals, guides, written in both Castilian and Tamuqua that we have actually been able to recreate a lot of the Tamuqua language. But there are other languages, like the Calusa, the Yusita, the Ocale, I mean the Tequesta, the Ais, I mean they're gone. They don't exist anymore because of this mix of, one of the reasons is actually the Spanish missions. They do most of the work because of slow, <coughs> systemic depopulation. Malaria becomes endemic and kills 20% every year. Then you have yellow fever. Then you have smallpox. By the way, smallpox is one of the reasons why the remaining natives would convert to Catholicism. Because if you survive, your own parents wouldn't recognize you. It's such a disfiguring disease. So we have the end here. And here's where I'll, I'll sort of slow down a little bit. Because we're, one of the greatest legacies that we have from this period, is that the French actually, Jacques Le Moyne, um, you know, they create images, some of our first images. They're problematic images. So, right, um, in a lot of ways they're problematic, in a lot of ways they're actually highly accurate. That's the way the French take possession, by the way. They build an actual monument and they ask you very nicely, do you want the French presence? The Spanish do it very, very different. This is actually one of the most important books that we read as historians. It's called Ceremonies of Possession and how, any, how different European groups take this differently. The Spanish would read a document that basically says, this is the Cliff's Notes Guide of Christianity. You will either convert now or we will destroy you. It's called the requirement because it is a requirement. It's read in Latin, by the way, to people who don't understand Latin. It, is, it serves one reason, and that is to legitimize destruction. They're not supposed to understand it. They're just supposed to reject it. This is totally different. And if I ever get there, you know, as crazy as this sounds, that's how you legitimize a primary source. I mean, we know in a lot of places it really did actually look like that. Did people bow before it? Probably not. But did they actually plant a physical pillar? Yes, they did. Because the Spanish find it later and destroy it. And so we, uh, we, we, that's there at Paris Island, right, where Charles Ford would have been. This is Tamuqua, right there, the ball game. A lot of natives in the Northeast would be the version of lacrosse. This is like a, a difference between rugby. There's a scrum at the beginning, and the ball is about this big. And if you hit the post with it, you get a certain amount of points. If you get it up on the top, you get a lot more points. It is extremely violent. They basically like shave themselves so that there's like no hair for you to pull. Right? People have broken limbs. The Spaniards hate this. And we know that something like that, you go to that and be like, how do you know that actually existed? At San Luis de Talamali, which is now downtown Tallahassee, where the longest running mission was, we have, and again, very bad imagery, the ball field. We had it completely recreated. The Spaniards hated it so much that they put crosses around it so they would contain all the evil within the ball field. Because you bet on it. The soldiers would bet on it. The friars hated it. But here, the friars would never ban it. Because if they banned it, they would rise up in rebellion. It was that important to them. You know, we could corroborate these sources is the point, right? You build an argument, use up all these sources. The, um, you know, in the Northeast, you would call this Manito. The idea that all living things are imbued with spiritual forces. That the world around you is a crazy violent, unknowable thing that you use shamans and drugs and trances, drugs by drugs I mean tobacco, stuff like that, to interpret this. If, if a swallow chirps at the wrong time of the day, you have to have that interpreted, right? You, you, you pray to your ancestors, you seek guidance for a good hunt. If you're a Spanish friar, what are you doing right now? I mean, you are, you are summoning, you are conversing with the devil. If I'm, if, if I'm a native and I'm telling you, a Spaniard, that I just went into a trance and I talked with the ancestors of my family and the animals, a Spanish friar would be like, no, 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 you were talking to Satan, right? Because none of that is in the Bible. You would look at that and go, very problematic. How about this one? You know, natives in the southeast are matrilineal. Which means the familial line moves through the mother's name, not the father's. 
There is a highly stratified sexual division of everything because a woman's power to give life is obvious. And a man's complementary power to take life is built from that, which is why women farm. And because women farm, women farm because they own the land. If, if there are clans, if there's a beaver clan and a bear clan, the man is of the beaver clan, the woman is from the bear clan, and they have a child, who does the child belong to? The woman's, the bear. You know, you would look at something like that and say, is that accurate? That's actually really accurate. Women plant. Men don't plant. Men don't farm. Men are allowed to only do the farming, like harvesting, tilling. They're not allowed to farm because their raw cosmological power to kill would destroy farming. Men hunt. Men partake in politics. Women farm. Can you imagine a Eurocentric view of this? If you are a Castilian who is a patriarchal society, which your head would just explode when you have to deal with women over land. <laughs> I mean, this is like, this is violent stuff, by the way, right? But this is a match, this is a matrilineal. By the way, right, do they have flowing Greek style hair? Probably not. Are they walking around naked all the time? Probably not. That is clearly made by a man. But <laughs> that's, the kind of, that's the kind of stuff that you have to work through. Is that source useful? Are we going to talk about the way women dress there? Probably not. Are we going to talk about the way that that actually depicts actual farming? The problem is they, by the way, this is, this is very problematic because you know what natives didn't have? Plows. They, they, they planted in molehills because they didn't have a plow. So that's problematic. But women farming, very true. Barbecue. Anywhere any Spaniard goes, anywhere, in the Caribbean, South America, the coast, Louis Cancer down in Tampa, uh, one of the uh, Jesuit priests, he is basically killed because he gets off the boat because people are offering him smoked fish. Smoked fish, they cure using smoke. That's called a barbacoa, which is where the term barbecue comes from. It's a raised wooden platform. It's obviously not roasting it because it would light on fire. You are preserving using smoke. No, one, no Spaniard preserves using smoke, right? They have pig roasts and they cure some of the best sausages and hams in the world are Spanish and Italian. They don't smoke meat. Natives smoke meat. My favorite one, the one that I will end with. That is Sacheria. He is a Mokama chieftain. I mean, he is on the north side of the St. John's River. The French are in that picture, not the Spanish. This comes straight from Fort Caroline, like 1563-1564. They are drinking something out of a conch shell. By the way, I, um, this is one of my favorite stories that I tell my students. I went to school at Florida State. And back in the day, when the football team was good, <laughs> it was good, and then it was bad, now it's sort of good again. But we won't go into that. But um, that's a still kind of a touchy subject. But back in the day, the president went to the professor that I was working under and said, we're doing a new anti-hazing initiative, and we want to tie the Seminole identity into it because the Seminole tribe was getting involved, and they said, Seminoles would never debase themselves, embarrass themselves by binge drinking. They are too, your identity is too, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You are too, you're too good for that. And he went to this, this professor I worked under, his name was Andrew Frank, and he said, you know, you have to uh, you know, write us a story about how Seminoles would never disrespect themselves by bench drinking. You know what's going on right here? <laughs> You'll notice that they're drinking from this huge cup. The women are brewing the tea, and that tea just happens to have a tremendous amount of caffeine in it, more caffeine than coffee. So here's the deal, is that if you're about to make a really important decision, there are certain things that you do. You do not have sex with your wife because her raw life-giving power will destroy your life-taking power. You fast for an entire day, and then right before you make an important decision, during the important decision, after you have fasted, you are on an empty stomach. You will drink this as fast as you possibly can, and you will have a nervous breakdown, and you will projectile vomit, because I am not kidding. What is going on here? <laughs> They are projectile vomiting. This is a cleansing. You are cleansing your system. You are cleansing your mind. 
You cannot make, and that's why I that's that, that's why I brought up why you why your why your wife is not involved in this. You are cleansing of everything that could possibly screw this up, and this is a very powerful. This is one of the most universal things that anyone sees in the southeast. We from all the Mississippian period all the way to the Seminoles. The, the post-removal Seminoles will go all the way down to the Everglades where this tree doesn't grow anymore. And the one thing they will go to Fort Lauderdale and buy, by the pound, is coffee. And people are like, why in the world are you buying coffee? Because this tree doesn't grow in the Everglades. And it's not the tree that counts. It's the black drink that counts. You're substituting the ingredients to keep the ceremony the same, right? And what do we see here? Has anybody ever seen that before? That is the Yopan Holly. By the way, I've had that, and you can buy it, and it makes me, it, this, I, this makes me sound kind of like it's dangerous. It's not, it's just, it's just tea, right? Just don't do it after you haven't drank and eaten anything for two days, and don't drink a gallon of it at one time. You'll be all right. But I invite anyone, and again, this is, I, I went to Jared and over here, and I said, can you, like, re-add my PowerPoint? Because I was actually walking up the steps, and now it's unfortunately dark, but you can still see it. If you walk down the steps rather than take the elevator, what will you see? A <laughs> Yopan Holly, right outside. I was walking up the stairs and it caught my eye and I was like, yes, I'm going to talk about that. And, uh, and, right, by the way, right, does anybody know what the taxonomic name of Yopan Holly is? Yes. <laughs> because whenever botanists come, that's the whole reason why William Bartram comes. He wants to like name new stuff, right? It's all about naming stuff. And you know, I mean, I have these primary sources. It's really quite excellent. All the way until the 19th century, Spaniards will go to St. Mark's over in the Panhandle and say, "This whole place smells like puke. Um, there must have been something really important happened last night." I mean, they will literally say it like that. So you know, some of these things. By the way, this is in there. This is in there. I mean, this is actually really important stuff, right? Don't, uh, when someone wants to fight over whether South Carolina versus uh, Texas barbecue is the best, say it's all La Florida style barbecue because it all <laughs> happened in the Southeast and it's all actually native. In fact, I grew up in the Southwest where smoked mullet is a really big deal. Uh, your first, America's first barbecue is smoked mullet. That's what that is because it is cured over smoke. But I use all these, you know, I'm not going to recap too much, but right, I mean, currents, the Catholic faith. Getting rid of pirates, the depopulation of this entire place. I, we don't really talk about transformations that much because I don't go into a whole lot of detail about the Seminoles, but Seminoles are creeks. They move into this area and they say, where are all the people? They literally move into a region that has been absolutely depopulated of people. And all the people are gone, but you know what is still there? The deer and the cow. The first Seminole that lives in Alachua, his name is the Cow Keeper because he moves into an area that the Patano, the Tamuqua, used to live in, Payne's Prairie. It's right there. And uh, King Payne is a Seminole. He names that prairie because he lives there. The only reason he lives there is because his uncle moved there because there was nobody living there and there were a ton of cows there. That was a Spanish ranch until the creeks destroyed it. Right? So transformations and then legacies, oranges. Here, you know, barbecue. I mean, it's like kind of a joke, but objectively it is true. Smoked mullet. But, <laughs> right? So I know I'm wrapping it up. Um, and uh, it's a long book, um, but it really tries to cover a lot of the connections, right? You see, like, everything that I've tried to do, everything I try to talk about, is stuff that you can connect to. It, it, it's stuff that you can still see around you, and that has really important sort of threads and legacies that, that go way back and influenced American history in one way or another, right? So, you know... I'm open to any questions. Does anybody have any questions? I know it was kind of a bad ending, but uh, <laughs> I'm just kind of wrapping up kind of out of time. I'm already three minutes over. Yeah. So tell me if this is accurate or not. Um, another one of those instances that uh, Florida beat, say, New England at. The story of the, uh, the guy that was marooned and was about to be barbecued. And then the chief's daughter, Juan Ortiz. Station. Juan Ortiz. He's in the book, by the way. It's a whole chapter on that because there's all these legends and myths. And what the gentleman is referring to is a story about a man who was basically cast away from the Pompeo de Narvaez expedition in 1528. He goes on shore and is snatched up by the natives. 
and he is a Calusa by the name of Yusita or Iriigua, and he hates Spaniards for obvious reasons. He's Calusa. They have really had bad relationships with Spaniards. This is a young kid, Juan Ortiz, and he tries to kill him several times. Tries to roast him over the flames on barbacoa, tries to shoot him full of arrows, successfully does shoot all of his companions full of arrows. And you know who saves him? A young woman and her mother, three times. And when it becomes clear that the chieftain is going to kill him, she secrets him away up to Tampa Bay to the Makosa in Tocobaga. And does that sound familiar? Pocahontas. He plagiarized that. John Smith, right, plagiarized that story from Juan Ortiz. You know, I mean, that's a bold statement, by the way. I'm not the only one to make it, and we will not ever truly know. But, but the story about John Smith's captivity is that he didn't talk about it for like 10 years. And you know what happened in between those 10 years? Juan Ortiz is rescued by Pedro, by Hernando de Soto. Juan Ortiz talks for years to Gracilaso de la Vega, who is a chronicler of the De Soto expedition. Gracilaso de la Vega writes his chronicle, and it is published in English. And guess who reads it? John Smith. So yes, that is a there is a very strong possibility that John Smith plagiarized his Pocahontas account and his Powhatan account off of Juan Ortiz. Whether that happens, we know that the Juan Ortiz thing was pretty accurate. Yeah. There's another one, by the way. Um, another one is uh, another man of African descent, Esteban the Moor or Esteban Ico, um, lands with Ponfield and Narvaez in Tampa. By the way, you know I won't go back too fast. I don't want to like give anyone a headache. But um, if I was to find it, this the blue one is Ponfield and Narvaez. He lands in Tampa Bay. He dies right around here. And the survivors march into Mexico City about eight years or seven years later. And there are 400 people that land in Tampa Bay. And you know how many people survived the march to Mexico City? By the way, Mexico City. They walk to Mexico City. Like four people. Everyone else dies. And one of the first is a man of African origin by the name of Esteban the Moor. They are the first across the Mississippi. It is like the first Lewis and Clark. It is a fantastic bit of travel lore. By the way, who is also in, um, in Juan Ponce de Leon's? First and second cruise, a man by the name of Juan Garrido, who was also of African descent. And that is in a chapter where uh, we talk about the connection between slavery and the Southeast. And, you know, I, I bring up 1619 because 1619 is an incredibly important date in the, uh, in the history of slavery in America. But uh, if you define America as including Florida, then there was slavery in St. Augustine for 100 years already before Jamestown. But uh, that's the next. I've just used those as, as examples. Um, the myth, right? There are myths. There are legends. One of the most obvious one that we are always taught as Floridians is the Fountain of Youth, complete myth. Oh. <laughs> You'll have to read about it in the book. <laughs> Don't fight me. I'm just the messenger. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? Yeah. When Sir Francis. Drake attacked all those port cities. Did the British attempt to keep any of them and establish their own, you know, fortress headquarters for the region, or was it just pillage, burn, and move on? So I do actually have a chapter on this too, which is why this book is so big. But <laughs> there is a point where um, Sir Francis Drake is knighted because he does a, a, such a good job of it. He is a privateer, not a pirate. Now, if you are Spanish, he's a pirate. If you are English, he's a privateer, which means he has a piece of paper that says, I'm working somewhat on behalf of the British government. That's called the letter of mark and reprisal. So as, as far as he is concerned, he's the quasi-navy of England in 1586. And we know this gets really out of control because of the Spanish Armada in 1588, and that's why Roanoke disappears, and it's all very interconnected. To answer your question is, he does not keep that because he's just a privateer who has to give Queen Elizabeth some of her cut, and he keeps the rest. But do you know what actually is already in existence when he is doing his worst work? Roanoke. He stops at Roanoke. Roanoke exists. Roanoke is a company. It is a joint stock venture. And the business model is piracy. So does that answer your question? The, that is where Roanoke is right there. That's where Jamestown is. That's the one that succeeds. Roanoke uh, is disappeared because everyone has to leave to go fight the Spanish, and they don't come back for like three more years. 
You could be Bear Grylls and you wouldn't survive three years by yourself on the other half of the world, right? So it's no mystery that they all disappeared. But the reason why you're there is because you are far enough away from St. Augustine to where they can't attack you without you knowing, but you are right still on the treasure fleet. And the, the best example is, I think in 1583 or 1584, Richard Grenville is sailing away from here, and guess what he overtakes off Bermuda? The treasure fleet. And he takes one. And he sails it. It's a much smaller ship. The treasure fleet ships are these huge galleons. They have a ton of guns on them, but what they don't do is maneuver very well at all. They're very slow. And if you can get out in front of it, if you take a broadside from 50 guns, you're in a lot of trouble. But the best thing that you can do from ship to ship is what they call cross the T, which is if you have a smaller ship, a smaller ship is actually very dangerous because you can outmaneuver a larger ship. You can stay out of firing distance and then cut right in front of it at the very end, and then all of your guns are raking down. It's called an inflating, I think, an inflating fire. You can rake down the entire ship, knock out all the masting. All you have to do is one of that, and you've won. And they do that right off of Bermuda. He, he takes over the ship. The Spanish surrender because they know they're beat. He sails it right into London, sells the proceeds of the ship and the billions of dollars of gold that are in its hull, and guess who gets that? This, the, this, the investors. It is sold, and the investors get a very handsome return on their profit. So to answer your question is, they are not going to take and hold St. Augustine. He would love to burn St. Augustine, but if, you, if you're asking if the British ever thought about their own venture, they're already there. Which is, by the way, another connection. The British only want to colonize America to rob the Spanish in Florida. Is the is the to whittle that down to a one sentence answer? Excellent question. Anybody else have a have a question? Yes. So I'll try one. Um, founding myths. Mm -hmm. The founding myth of the of the U.S. is um, English good, Spanish bad, which gets translated into American good, Spanish bad, which is related to Protestant good. Catholic bad. How do you um, tell a story like yours without, um, and trying to be objective, mm -hmm. without just feeding that myth to keep that myth going? Because that's one reason why we don't hear the Florida story. Mm -hmm. Because it's a story of the bad people who happen to be Catholic and Spanish. You know, I don't have an easy, I guess the point of this book is to attempt to undo that. It is a very deeply held myth, and I think, I, it's not a myth. It, you know, like, New England is very important. And the English win this, right? I mean, Spain can claim all of this. They can't control it. La Florida is this. A hundred years later, it's this. A hundred years later, it's that. And then it's gone, right? They lose the war of colonialism. Um, and so, also, you know, there's a lot of ideas of, I mean, when you think of the Puritan story and the Pilgrim story, do you ever hear about the Pequot Massacre or King, Philium, or King Philip's War? <laughs> it is a triumphant identity-creating story where you have good Protestant work ethic values and that, is, that just pulls people together. Doesn't, that's the story that like, people want to hear, if that makes sense. And what this does is it complicates that. I mean, there, that is not the only story. It is one story, but it is not the only story. And I know that it's, it's hard to like, put a date or a moment or an idea on, on, why, on why so much of the country would... would would rally around that story. But that's a story that is, it's, when it's told to you, it is a very triumphant story. It's not even that in reality. I mean, within years of the first Thanksgiving was the Pequot Massacre. And, and within 10 years of that, I mean, there was active the destruction of the natives. But, um, I, you know, I would argue that, 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 try, that this is trying to do that. It's a, it's a, we, we all probably knew that St. Augustine, Augustine had the first Thanksgiving, but that doesn't matter. It's the first Thanksgiving, it's a really cool side story, but then you go back to the real Thanksgiving. And, uh, and you know, I guess this is sort of an attempt. Um, it's probably not going to work, but, um, you know, it's an attempt to just open people's eyes to the, to the, many, the, to the many stories that are American origin stories. Yes? Yes, um, my name is Beverly Trey, and I'm a born old-time woman from the Elder family here. 
and all my life, my whole entire human existence as a Catholic, all I've ever known is beautiful, good, humanitarian stories, all of my life. <laughs> all of my life. And that's all I've ever known. And it takes time to meet people. It takes time. To, we've always welcomed people. And our town now, I'm concerned because we have a lot of new people here disconnected. And quickly, they're owning our town without knowing what our town is all about upon introductory. They'll tell you quickly they're from here. And um, it's kind of sad because they're erasing our town right before our very eyes. And uh, this is a good town, and, and uh, all I've ever known uh, is to enjoy and appreciate and value being from this town and being from a good, a beautiful uh, family of color and knowing the uh, priests of all textures from Ireland, from Italy and all these different places and they came here as humanitarians and uh, they loved on us and we loved them back. <clears throat> and we're missing that now and uh, we gotta reach back into our souls and our spirits and we gotta get that because we're losing ourselves now. We're in a, a, quite a turmoil here now in, uh, in America and on this earth. And we gotta get into our souls and, be, and let our better selves show. Hallelujah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm a, uh, you know, my, um, my, my son Warren was born in Myrtle Beach, which makes him the first generation South Carolinian, and that sort of crushed my heart a little bit. Because I'm actually, I'm actually a fourth generation Floridian who grew up in uh, the Fort Myers area. Oh, did you? I know a lot about what you're talking about, but uh, especially after Charlie moved through, and entire communities were wiped out and remade into completely different... I, I, I am not trying to poke holes in anyone's history, particularly the groans I heard about the Fountain of Youth. <laughs> um, you know, there is a very rich history, and you know, uh, you know, the, the Protestant history of New England is not as rosy as you think it is. The Catholic history of Florida is complicated. The missionaries that were here beginning in the 17th century were not the same conquistadors that would read the requirement. It has changed over time. I would I, w I like to talk to my students in, in, in my history classes about you know the inability of Lutherans back in the day to even turn the page to the second half of the Bible. Um, they were very much Exodus and Leviticus, and you know the faith has changed and democratized quite a bit. And you know I'm not I'm not trying to disparage any religious group whatsoever, but it is you know it's a complicated history and it's a very rich history. There are native voices. In this region, there is a long, incredibly long and rich native voice. The history of enslavement and exploitation goes back to the very, very first day of this region, as does the native history, as does the... It's just, I guess, what I'm trying to do is, you know, complicate things a little bit. That's what we do best. <laughs> yeah, and then... And then uh, good do you talk at all about uh, shipwrecks or transporting cargo from Havana to Florida and then out to back to home home base? Um, like I mostly we have a boat we're looking for right now mm -hmm. called the San Miguel. Mm -hmm. Went down in 1715. Mm -hmm. That's part of the, the 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 plate fleet. Yeah. I actually talk about that. Um, quite, I don't talk about the 15, the 1715 fleet, but I, I used to bring up these maps that would show you, um, that would show you shipwrecks, and there's about a million of them right here because of how, because of how dangerous this is. I, I, I do talk about it quite a bit. I think that that's one of the most important connections that drives the attempt to colonize, is that, is that it is, it's something that needs to be done to literally save lives. When, 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 when Pedro Benitez de Aviles goes down here and he finds Juan Ortiz, he literally ransoms like a dozen castaways. And so he goes back to Spain and says, we have got to be here because castaways are wrecking every day. Um, yeah, so it, it is, when, when in, in, that, in that connections part, I would argue that, that the shipping connection is one of the most important connections that this region has. So yes, the answer is yes, absolutely. I am personally fascinated by that. The Atocha down here, I mean, that's fascinating stuff. We know that, you know, what, for anyone who's not familiar with 1715, you have an entire treasure fleet that sails from Havana and is hit with a major hurricane right here. 11 out of the 12 ships go down, 1,000 people die. And you can still, after a good cold front, find buried treasure in the sand. 
because they only recovered 50% of it. And they went down literally on the beach. And, uh, and actually, there's a chapter in, that got cut, so don't look for it in the book, unfortunately. But <laughs> what basically said is when that goes down in 1715, that actually lines up exactly with the golden age of piracy because uh, Jamaica becomes unwelcoming of pirates, and so they all go basically to Nassau. And this is where Benjamin Ornigold is based out of, and he is one of the ones that basically makes a tremendous amount of money by raiding the wreck, and they come back and they have this huge party for years in Nassau, and it, and it basically attracts all these pirates in. And so even in 1715, you could argue that even if it's not Florida, the land, it's the water off of it is just as important. I have a question, it's hypothetical. If you take the impact of the Europeans and you separate out the violent pieces of it, the tyrannical pieces of it, and the disease, and the three different things, so my argument would be as soon as the Europeans came to America, came to the southeast, landed on shore, met with natives, they started a process, that started a process of killing out most of the natives because they had no way to protect themselves from diseases from Europe. Mm -hmm. So even if you forgot about the violence, you forgot about the rest of it, they would have killed most of the natives. Um, you know, that, that is the prevailing argument. You're not wrong. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the, the thing about that is we don't really know what happens in the interior, um, where these massive, dense Mississippian communities are, like Cahokia or Itawa or Kusa or Chaska, where DeSoto goes. We don't have... We don't have evidence. But they had, no, they had no way of curing but themselves from any of Absolutely. They had um, never seen them before. If anyone has basically read Jared Diamond's uh, Guns, Germs, yeah. and Steel, yeah. it's basically the idea that, that one half of the world has domesticated animals and the other doesn't. And domesticated animals get you sick, and over thousands of generations getting sick develops an immune system, and one half of the world does not have that. So when you bring pigs and you bring chickens over, then you have two of the most popular flus in the world. And then they are vectors in that area. And then you have yellow fever because of mosquitoes. And natives are basically living with a advanced autoimmune disease. They have absolutely no ability to fight off an infection. So every one of them. And that is so transformative to native communities. You know, I went into culture at the very end. All these native communities are not only matrilineal, but they have oral traditions. They don't write stuff down. They don't have a, they don't have a written language. And they, they share stories in the winter time by basically shacking everyone up with their grandparents for months at a time when it's cold and you sing stories and you tell creation legends and everything is passed orally down through traditions and songs and dances and it that works perfectly well until every single grandparent dies at the same time and when every single elder dies at the same time you have not just lost your family you have lost your entire cosmology your entire history your combined knowledge it is not just the destruction of physical bodies. It is the complete and utter destruction of entire societies. And the people that do survive, 10 or 15%, they are refugees. You don't stay here when everyone is dead. You leave and you displace down rivers. And in all of these maps, you will notice, and this is why it is incredibly violent and it is destructive. It's also transformative, and I do talk about this in the book, is that when you look at a map right here, you don't hear of the Yusita or the Makama. You hear of the Creek and the Cherokee and the Seminole and the Choctaw. This is Creek territory right here. The Creeks are made of everyone who survived. They are called a coalescent society. They are a refugee people. The Choctaw are the survivors here. The Chickasaw are the survivors here. The Cherokee are the survivors here. The Catawba are the, the survivors here. The remaining 10% of all of these societies that remains alive, regroup, they coalesce, and they become somebody else. And so in the end, you would not have Seminoles, Creeks, Cherokees, or Choctaws, or Chickasaws without this period of transformation, which is why I call it a period of transformation. But you are right, right? Uh, a, a man on a horse with a steel blade and a 140-pound dog that's trying to rip your throat out is going to do a tremendous amount of damage to someone who does not have access to steel. They use war clubs, and their body armor are reeds and leather. Body armor, you might as well be naked with a Spaniard with a lance on a battle horse. He's standing 12 feet tall. They still can't kill that many people. Disease does that. And it doesn't just, and again, 
De Soto leaves in, in 1539, 1541. He's gone and he's dead, and no one tries that again for almost 100 years. But when the French move down the Mississippi River, they have all of these accounts that there should be people there, and there aren't. Do they recognize at the time that they were the ones passing this disease? Ab absolutely not. So they had no equipment. And, you know, it would take, it would take a week for, for smallpox mm -hmm. to, um, to become viral. A lot of times they were gone. A lot of times they didn't care. In fact, you know, this gets really dark, but a lot of times they would call it God's providence. Yeah. You know, when I said earlier that, that Spanish missionaries would say something like that to natives and say, why do you think I get sick and I, I survive and you get sick and everyone is dying? Because you're sinners. And, 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 and by the way, if at least you would receive confession, you may not go to hell. It's the best I can offer you. Although the U.S. government did use that knowledge a hundred years later, yes, by giving Native Americans infected blankets. Yeah, um, yeah, Pontiac's War, uh, Detroit. Um, what's his face? Uh, I actually read that before. Um, I mean, I actually read his documents. It's actually quite shocking. But by 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 the Revolution, Washington is inoculating his men. By Pontiac's War, they're basically saying, you know, rub yourself in blankets. They they come to figure it out, but not during that time. I'm going to ask that this this be the last question yes. we have as a group, but I run out of time. Continue asking questions to Dr. Kokomore once we conclude. Back to the French. Uh, the government of France is now in possession legally of a monument similar to the one that was destroyed at Fort Caroline that was recovered off of uh, Cape Canaveral, uh, with the Lowe's fleet being destroyed in the hurricane. Any updates on what the plans are for that? I'm not sure. That's the first time I've heard of that, actually. That's, uh, I definitely have to look that up. I know that, that this is all tricky politics in the 21st century. I know there's a gigantic shipwreck off Columbia that's working its way through um, inter the international court system. But, I mean, the idea of who owns shipwrecks is something that's been litigated over the course of hundreds of years because it's obviously big business. and so It's still salvaging its big business. Well, but they, they, I, I was unfamiliar that a monument. I, I know that there are active attempts to find Revolt's fleet because he was crushed in a storm. Yeah, they, so that, they've got it. And, mm -hmm. and now, because if you've been to Fort Caroline, it's only open a few days a week. Mm -hmm. And that's something where you can entrust a priceless mm -hmm. you know, monument like this to be housed. I was just wondering if. I, I'm, I'm just casually familiar with the attempts to find his fleet, and I know that they have found several <laughs> ships, but I wasn't familiar with that. That's a very interesting addition to the story. I'm, I'll definitely have to look that up. Yep. Got it. Thank, you. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight.